we come with questions. The problem with coming with questions, and I'm all about questions, is it seems in this text that bad questions become contagious. And we catch the disease and we keep asking bad questions, offering bad answers. The sermon title is, was literally difficult for me to type into my computer, Who Sinned? Because that question is rejected at the very beginning of the text, and yet bad questions are contagious. And so we titled the whole week, Who Sinned? Even while we reject the religious framework that imagines sin was necessary to make this man blind. We need to talk about a problem in the room. Scripture is a culturally received document. It is a culturally written document. And there's garbage in the text. Holy? Yes. Unique and authoritative witness to God and God's truth? Yes. Free of garbage? No. And the religious framework of not just the Pharisees, but of the disciples and of those who recorded Jesus' comments and wrote them in the gospel, the religious framework they lived imagined that if you were differently able, you were also less than. And that's garbage. But it's not distant history to us. It's the kind of garbage that still exists in our minds today. It's just unnaturally natural to treat someone who we think of as disabled as being less than. And the text falls prey to that treatment. If this man is blind, he must have done something to deserve it. Or his parents must have done something wrong. We don't say that today in theological language, but we still say it in emotional language. We still say it in scientific language. We shame people all the time for the things they do that make them different than the norm. How many times have we accidentally been the person, uh, at first light actually, Dina pointed out that the fingers that are crossed could also be doing shame, shame on you, which I always used to think looked like peeling your finger like a carrot. Their language shames. It shames him over and over and over again in the text. He's a blind man. He's a beggar. He's not worthy of listening to. How painful was it for you to listen to them say, where's the man that used to be here? Oh, I'm right here. Does anyone know where the man was that used to be here? Uh, um, I'm right here. Anyone, anyone know what happened to this guy? But they're so used to not seeing him as worthy. They can't hear him trying to answer their own questions. It gets worse. Then they want to engage his parents. Well, was he really blind? What do you think happened? You know, go talk to him. He's of age. Is that like the most awkward question ever? And then they they do come to talk to him again, and and he calls them on it. Do you really want to ask me again? Because you didn't want to listen to me the first time. And I have nothing new to say. Unfortunately, 
that kind of othering, that kind of silencing, that kind of seeing some people as more worthy than others to be listened to and to be seen happens around us all the time. And even the process of asking folks to humanize those who have been marginalized is seen as a social justice woke movement we don't want any part of. That's the exact same movement the Pharisees go through in the text. When they can't get him to change his story, they write him out of their story. They make him leave because he challenges, his very existence challenges their religious framework. Even his parents don't really stand up for him because it's hard to want to associate themselves with him because they see where his story is going. They see him being kicked out and they're sitting there weighing, give up the entire world we know, give up the home that we know, or ir ir inseparably link our story to his by standing up for him. This Jesus did something you didn't believe possible. And all your rules claim isn't possible. Which means, I don't know, but it does mean there's something wrong with your rules. I love, I love the, the man who's wanting to get, to get put on the hook. How did this happen, right? They don't immediately go to, it can't be possible. But first, it's almost like they're trying to figure out, how can we market this thing, right? How can we figure out how to recreate this moment? They only want to reject that the moment happened once they find they can't do that. And, and they're like, so how did it happen? He goes, well, I, I don't really know. Well, is the man a sinner or not? I don't really know. Here's the only thing I know. This is the man's testimony. I couldn't see, and now I can. Yeah, but no, 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 that's, that's it. I couldn't see, and I can. And it strikes me by implication. The man then says, the difference is I'm trying to figure out now what I do see, and you all are reveling and doubling down on not seeing. Jesus says at the very end of the text in a, in a, in a, in a weird little conundrum of uh, the, I've if you had been able to see, you would sin, and if you weren't able to see, you would, would not have sinned. I think what Jesus is getting at is this story about trust and imagination. Jesus is is understanding that so sure of their sight are the Pharisees and his disciples, mind you, his disciples are in the same exact theological framework as the Pharisees. His tradition is in that framework. And Jesus is, is kind of pointing out that when you're in that framework and you're sure you know what you can see, you won't believe anything that doesn't meet your knowledge. But the man who can't see, who has learned to have to trust in that which he doesn't know, the man who has known his limits from the beginning and figured out how to live within those limits, fair or not, trusts that there is so much about this world beyond what he can see. And so he is open to the miraculous, and they are not. And the question then the text ends up getting us to is, who here really can see? Right? The question isn't who sinned. The question is who can see? Who is choosing to be open to seeing? And who is choosing to stay blind? Because it's more comfortable to hold on to the framework and worldview you've always known than had it be challenged by what you're being presented. It is 
a weird little circuitous piece to this story that I think it's fascinating if you go back to the Genesis text of creation. What is the fruit of the tree that makes the fall happen? What fruit do they eat of? What tree do they eat the fruit of they were not supposed to? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The questions that they're asking today are the fruit of that tree. That some people must be good and some people must be evil and some people must be sinners and some people must not be sinners and those things must explain what happens in the world rather than sometimes bad things just happen. Sometimes our disabilities can become gifts. Sometimes our vulnerability is our way into new truths. And our invincible knowledge is our way to perpetuate oppression. It's when we get sure that we can figure out the world, the knowledge of good and evil, that we start operating above our pay grade. I don't know if the man's a sinner, I don't know how he did it. I know that I couldn't see. And now I can. And that's beautiful. The world is beautiful. He shouldn't have been able to heal you. He shouldn't have wanted to heal you. This is terrible. Two different rhetorics, one set of events... We talk a lot in, um, in this world about confirmation bi bias, that we're ready to believe those things that confirm what we already believe. I think this text reminds us we don't talk enough about our, our efforts to disbelieve things that do not confirm what we already believe. That the world is presenting us new information all the time. God is saying, I am doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? And the answer is no, because we don't want to. Because it doesn't align what we hope to believe. What we've always believed. And this is so important if what we're asking in Lent is what are you seeking? What are you seeking about yourself? What are you seeking as your sense of call? What are you seeking about the peace that we all yearn to feel bubbling up within us? The kind of peace that feels it's drawn on the face of the man in that picture who's gazing through their hands at a heavenly reality of his belovedness that they have never let him feel. If we're seeking that, but we're only willing to see and hear the voices and the things that take us to the conclusion we hope God has for us, we are walking very small journeys. We are horses in the parade with our blinders firmly on. If we're going to seek, we're going to have to start asking ourselves hard questions about the things we're not willing to see, the voices we're not willing to hear, the truths we're not willing to have revealed to us because they may be essential to the peace we're looking for. Every person in this story is a mix of sin and belovedness. That's not what we're meant to fixate on. The question is, how do we pour our love that God has poured into us onto the world? How do we build larger and larger rather than smaller and smaller communities of grace? How do we let go of the garbage script and words that are in our head? It's not done in a day or maybe even in a lifetime. It's the constant work 
of saying, does what I'm about to do honor me, this person, and the God that created us both? And if the answer is no, let that garbage go. What is God trying to show us that we're not willing to see? This is the word of our Lord.